Dave Chappelle. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, it's awesome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, nerds. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so who does it? Who's like, I'm going to go see the news live? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you have never endorsed anybody. You didn't endorse Obama. People came back from the dead, black people, to endorse Obama. What, 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 what do you know about Ben Jealous that makes you want to come out and endorse Ben Jealous? Well, what do I know about Dave Chappelle? I know exactly. <laughs> what I, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, Van, I'm, uh, I'm not a real political dude. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of a cynic when it comes to politics. However, uh, this, this particular election was exciting to me because Ben and I are like family. Mm. Our fathers were best friends. My dad was his godfather. Wow. And when I was growing up, I never met Ben. He was just like a picture on the wall. <laughs> and and, and uh, when, when I moved to New York to do stand-up, my dad said, you know, you got a god brother at Columbia. You should go and hook up with him. And, and Ben and I hooked up, and we became fast friends. First thing I, I realized about Ben, you know, we're similar in age, but his intellect was daunting. Yeah. Man, this guy is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And from the time I was 17 to now I'm 44, I watch him work on equity, like sincerely and diligently work on equity uh, outside of the system. Well, ben got kicked out of Columbia True. at one point. I, I mean, he, he was protesting. The, 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 the university had bought the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated, and they were going to demolish it, and Ben was incensed. And he was like, man, you got to come up to this protest with me. And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> and, and, and Ben got himself arrested. He got put out of school. And for two years, I watched him, you know, try to find his way. Academia was his life, and it was taken from him. And it took, it was two long years. He got back into Columbia and killed it. Right. Got the Rhodes Scholarship. And it was a very... First of all, that's hard to do right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And, and when he got the scholarship, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone was very proud of Ben. And my father said to Ben, he said, I, I'm very happy, I'm very proud that you won the scholarship. And then he said, my fear is that they're awarding you the scholarship so that you'll no longer be a threat. Pop was a gangster. My dad was a cynic, too. His and dad went to Brown University at age 15. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was him, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it was also like 1953. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was not a comfortable time to be brown at brown. <laughs> <laughs> but but my, dad, my, my dad's fears were because he's from the generation where, you know, we petitioned the system from the outside. This is a post-Obama world. We've seen a community activist become the president of the, of the United States. Yeah. And um, these times are daunting, man. I mean, even as a comedian, I travel all around the country. It's cynical out here. It's polarized in a way that I've never seen it before. Uh, and I feel like Ben is a uniter. Oh, I yeah. feel like as, as, as a policymaker, he's imaginative. And he understands people, like actual people. So for a cynic like me, he restores my faith in an institution that takes an enormous amount of money from me. <laughs> the yeah. government. <laughs> yeah, the government. That's right. The, it, it makes me understand that a person that, that I know and trust can actually participate in government at a very high level and affect real change. That I think is, is pertinent. But you also um, are trying to build some interesting bridges. I want to show a clip that I think can show the, can get us off to a good start in this trying to bridge some of these divides. Let's, let's hear a little bit from Dave in your genre, as you say. <laughs> Full disclosure. The poor whites are my least favorites. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of trouble out of them. And I'd never seen so many of them up close. I looked them right in their coal-smeared faces. And to my surprise, you know what I didn't see? I didn't see 
one deplorable face in that group. I saw some angry faces and some determined faces, but they felt like decent folk. And I listened to them. I listened to them say naive, poor white people things. <laughs> Man, Donald Trump's going to go to Washington, and he's going to fight for us. <laughs> I'm standing there thinking in my mind, you dumb mother. You are poor. He's fighting for me. <laughs> I just think that is just a, such a brilliant distillation of, of where we are. People don't know. You live in rural Ohio. People think of you as this urban legend, but you actually live in rural Ohio. Yes, I do. And now we're, you know, two years in. The economy has gotten better than, than, than it's continued to get better. Uh, what would you say to those folks who are still uh, uh, big Trump supporters uh, today as we go into the midterms? You know, this is a tough question for me, Van. I got to tell you, first of all, the town that I live in is a small town. Yes. And it's like a little blue Bernie Sanders island in the Trump seat. They love Donald Trump. Uh, I don't even know that they love him as much as they're frustrated, they're fed up, and a lot of these white people feel like their voices don't matter anymore. You know, that their concerns aren't important or what have you. So, to be honest with you, in the, in the name of safety, I wouldn't tell him anything about that guy. <laughs> I, I don't believe that I'll change anybody's mind or anything, mm -hmm. right. but, but for me personally, you know, I get along with everybody, uh, whether I agree with them Politically or not, right, right. but I thought when you're actually trying to pull this democracy together, yeah. keep it from getting torn apart, you have to talk to everybody. You have to listen to everybody. That's right. I was out on the Eastern Shore, and I was giving a speech. A guy who voted for Trump asked me what I thought about Medicare for all, and I said I support it. He said, "Well, what if they won't do it at the federal level?" I said, "Then we'll do it at the state level." He said, "Then I'll vote for you." Trump support. Yeah, I said, and I kind of said, I said, you voted for Trump, and now you're going to vote for the former national president of the NAACP. I said, tell me why. He said, I'm a finance manager at a car dealership. My bottom line is my business and my people. Mm. Neither one of them gets healthier until we can get health care we can afford. And if he won't do it, and you will, then I'll vote for you. There is this question, though, around... Democrats versus Republicans, and you have people like Kanye West who's saying, listen, uh, you know, love you guys and, and Democrats. Excuse me, one second. Uh, well, you know where I'm going with this. You know, Kanye, Kanye says that, you know, we, it's time out for Democrats. What do you guys think? Uh, well, I think that, first of all, you know, Kanye is an artist, man. Yes. And, and he's a genius. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, well, whatever he's saying right now, I think that the angle he's seeing things from is about the division that he sees. And, and he's not inconsistent with what he's saying. For instance, a decade ago, I read a quote where he said he wanted to, to take the Confederate flag and reappropriate it some other different kind of way. I mean, there's a MAGA hat, whatever, man. The, the thing that's scary about this presidency is after it. I don't know if you've been married before or had a girlfriend and, and said something in a fight that was so wrong, and then after that, mm. we, we still family, we still around each other, but man, I sure did say all that shit, didn't I? Mm. And uh, I'm not mad at Kanye. That's my brother. Mm. I love him. I support him. I buy his albums. No but, claps? Oh, man, that was rough. I, no, whether people clap or not, whether people clap or not. But, you know, I don't have to agree with everything that he says. I, I, just, I just trust him as a person of intent. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he shouldn't say all that shit. But <laughs> but, but, but let, let me let me let me take it on, on the argument. Then. So to take his personality out of it, yeah. uh, what about the argument he's making, which is that you know it's almost you're in this PC prison, you can't say anything, and and, and you're not allowed to vote for Republicans if you're if you're African American. Uh, but what's your argument to people who feel like it's time to give Republicans a chance? Uh, well, why, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an argument being made by a minority. But I, well, I'll say this: I'm not a partisan dude. If he ran as a Republican, I'd vote Republican. If I if I got a chance to vote for somebody like this, I'm voting for. This somebody isn't about like party. That. This is about ideas. That's right. 
the ideas have kind of migrated from party to party. The Democrats used to be much more conservative. Today, however, unfortunately, there's only one party that stands for civil rights. There's only one party that stands for environmental protection. And we have to, as voters, really listen to the ideas. What I say to folks is that look, the war on drugs has failed. Trickle-down economics has failed. We have to have the courage to put ideas on the table that actually lift up working families, white, black, brown, Native American, Asian American. We've got to move beyond the labels of party and look at ideas, but let's also be clear. Donald Trump's party is Donald Trump's party, and what they stand for right now, we have to fight with everything we have. The other big issue, you, you, we're talking about race, talking about class, gender. We're now in a situation where a whole new set of voices is coming forward. How do you guys look at the role of this new movement uh, for women's empowerment, the Me Too movement, et cetera? I hope it succeeds. What we all have to realize is that we all have to stand up in this moment and say that these women who have the courage to step forward, these men in many places, the courage to step forward who were sexually assaulted as well, we have to believe survivors. We have to have their back, and we have to figure out how we finally leap forward because we've been staying stuck for a long time. It shattered a lot of lives, and enough is enough. Yeah, I think that for most men, especially the men that I'm talking to, one, I'll tell you that as a movement, it's effective. Like, in, in Hollywood, the, the, the man, they are buttoning up. Which is good. Which yeah, is good. It's better than good. It's, it's, it's necessary. Two, I'll say that there's a lot of men that are learning for the first time the extent of the plight of the women in their lives. We're just learning that consent is important. Most of our states, they don't teach consent when they teach sex ed. Think about that. That's right. And this is a tough discussion, but it needs to be had. Yeah. And people need to learn the lessons, and we need to listen to one another. Yeah. I think that some people are so threatened by the movement, or they're so worried about it, that they're not hearing the messaging behind it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an idea this time has come, and we'll see. Did, did you watch Ka the Kavanaugh uh, 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 testimony, the hearings, all that kind of stuff? Uh, I've seen, I've seen highlights. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. what, what was your, what was your uh, take and impression? Can you imagine an African American or a female yelling at them senators like that? Uh, oh, you mean the way that Kavanaugh yelled? Yeah. Um, or any of it. You know, man, I'm, you know, I'm from this area. Like I grew up around here, and, and this is yeah, the sad thing about it is, I believe sadly. If that woman had gone to the police in 1982 and told them exactly what she had told the Senate, that he wouldn't have gone to jail. Not in that place, not in that time, not with no name like Brett Kavanaugh. Mm. Uh, it, w it was daunting. It also made me sad that this is a national discussion that's happening during a Supreme Court nominee's hearing. It's a tough time for this country, man. I, we got a lot more to talk about. I want to talk to Ben and I want to talk to uh, Dave Chappelle about mass incarceration and marijuana, which I never thought I'd talk to Ben Jealous about. When we get back. <laughs> Show. I'm here with comedy legend Dave Chappelle and the man that got him to wade into politics, Democratic nominee for the Maryland governorship, Ben Jones. Give them both a round of applause to be back. Um, what did you say to Ben Jealous to get him to be pro marijuana decriminalization? Because I've known Ben for a long time and that is not Ben's thing. So what did you, you must have done, you must have no, said I'm not, something. I'm not nearly as fun as some of my friends. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, I can testify yeah. that you are not. So, <laughs> so well, what, 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 what was that conversation like? To get somebody like a Ben Jealous to be on board with, with decriminalizing marijuana? Well, Ben, you just got to be consistent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, yo, I, 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 I couldn't take credit for it, man, but, but uh, I got to say, uh, when I heard it was on this platform, I was, I was uh, pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I think that it's a very important issue, uh, especially in the state of Maryland. And you can speak more about that, but how it affects Baltimore. But as you know, Maryland's gone through a lot the last few years. We had big uprisings in Baltimore City after the Freddie Gray case. Two years later, murders had kept climbing up, 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 up. And I asked a retired member of the Baltimore Police Department, recently, recently retired captain, to go across the city as only a retired member of BPD could and talk to commanders on the ground mm -hmm. and find out what they were saying about why murders were going up. He came back, he said, you know, there are two interesting data points. He said, 
one was that nobody could really agree, a lot of debate about what's been happening in the last two years. He said, on the other hand, if the question is what's been going on in the last 10 years, they were all in agreement that half the shootings in the city, half the murders in the city were one set of marijuana dealers killing another set of marijuana dealers. Mm. And I said, how could that be? I think it was a relatively peaceful drug. He says, but it's not about the drug. It's about the trade. So the violence of the trade is about territory. And a little idea, went, you know, a little light bulb went off in my head. I said, look, this is no more harmful than alcohol. And alcohol, we all know, can be very harmful in many ways. Then if we legalize it, and you're, the police officer told me we can bring down killings, I said, well, what's happening in Washington State? What's happening in Colorado? Killings are coming down. Mm -hmm. And I said, and then we take money out of the pockets of gangs and cartels, and we put it, the money in the pockets of farmers and business people? and we do that in an equitable way, that's a big deal. And then we tax it, and we take the money that we can tax from it, and we're able to fund, it was, it's enough money to fund universal pre-K for every four, universal full day pre-K for every four year old in the state. So you, so you came at it more as a, as a, as a business guy and as a, as a smart dad guy well, as opposed to. Well, and as a murder victim family a member, I've had two family members shot in Maryland in the last 10 years. And if you tell me that we can bring down killings by legalizing cannabis, you have my full attention. I'm just saying, man, it, 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 it doesn't just quell violence in Baltimore. It, it stops a lot of violence and a lot of mayhem. And it's uh, fun to smoke and relax. <laughs> Well, look, that may be true about marijuana, but there are other drugs that are, are much, uh, much worse. Uh, our mutual friend, all of us had a mutual friend in Prince uh, yeah. who uh, died because of a, a fentanyl overdose. Uh, it, I saw you in a stand-up uh, thing in Los Angeles <laughs> where you were talking about the impact of heroin uh, in, in rural America. What are you seeing in rural America when it comes to this whole opioid uh, epidemic? A role reversal. A role reversal. Yeah. Poor white people look like black people in the 80s with a different drug of choice. And it's very sad to hear the vocabulary, now this is a health crisis. We were begging for them to call that crack epidemic a health crisis. We were criminalized, we were marginalized, and now these heroin addicts are here, and, and, and man, if they don't have our baby clothes on. It's terrible to see. In, in both ways, it's terrible to see the pain and suffering and terrible, uh, terrible to see the hypocrisy politically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your concern about marijuana legalization possibly then opening the floodgates for things like opioids, heroin, fentanyl? So there's a lot of lives that are being shattered right now. I mean, opioid deaths in Maryland up, up 160 percent in four years. We have to treat it like a public health crisis. And, and I wish we could go back in time. We can't. We just got to learn and go forward. In that respect, this is a, a gateway drug to common sense. On drug reform, wow. we've 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 got to deal with this public health crisis as a public health crisis. Uh, famously on, on SNL, uh, you said uh, uh, you wanted to give Trump a chance, but you also wanted to make sure that he gave disenfranchised people a chance. Looking at the Trump presidency, almost two years in, do you feel that he gave disenfranchised people a chance? It's hard to tell where Trump uh, ends and his constituents begin, but I think that the rhetoric of his presidency is repugnant. I just don't like the way he talks. I don't like, uh, you know, there's certain, we're living in a time where there's got to be a little more cultural sensitivity. And, and even a guy like me that's just writing jokes, I have to listen more than I've ever had to listen because the gripes is coming so fast and furious. And, and, and I'm not dismissive of people's gripes. It might sound like it on stage, but, but I, I listen. And, and, and as a president of a country that's as, as eclectic as ours, you know, you look around your crowd, you see it's like a patchwork of people. I just think that uh, he's speaking to a very small choir. Mm -hmm. And there's so many more opinions that he's, the way he, just the way he engages the public is dismissible. I don't like talking bad about the president, but I, I said we should give him a chance because he's the president of the United States now. Well, what choice do I have? Right, right. But I think you also apologized for that sometime later, didn't you? Well, I don't ever apologize yeah. for that. Yeah, what I you said, said is, I, <laughs> <laughs> I said I shouldn't have said that shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Let's be clear, right? Let's be clear. Donald Trump is playing a politics of divide and conquer. He's picking scapegoats all day long. Mm -hmm. Muslims, Mexicans, immigrants, black folks, women. It goes on and on. Yep. Right. Occasionally, you know, and so... What do we do in that moment? We actually have to listen to each other. We have to talk to each other respectfully. We got to pull each other together because the only thing that beats the politics of divide and conquer is the politics of unite and prosper. Mm -hmm. 
And that's only possible if we're willing to respect each other and listen to each other. Well, listen, uh, I, I, you gave people a reason to tune in, and you're giving people a reason to, to turn out. I can't tell you how much it means. Uh, my dream is coming true, having a show like this. I know your dreams have come true, being able to be one of the greatest that we've ever seen, rock the microphone. <laughs> and for you to be on the, the campaign trail raising these issues, dreams can't come true in America. When we get back, I'm talking to the most famous astrophysicist in the universe, Neil deGrasse Tyson. We're going to get his take on the increasing attacks on climate science and President Trump's Space Force when we get back. My next guest is America's favorite scientist. He's an astrophysicist. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium, and he is the author of 15 books. His latest book is called Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. It's already on the New York Times bestseller list. Please welcome to the Van Jones Show, Neil deGrasse Tyson in the house. What, what are you doing here? What, what? Listen, <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> this is your life. <laughs> oh, my Whoa. goodness. It's, Thanks it's, for having me, man. Oh, it's, an, it's an honor to have you here. We're excited about it. Listen, you are somebody, you know, you deal with facts. You deal with uh, analysis, rationality. How are you handling this world now where it seems like it's facts over feelings, anger over analysis? Feelings over facts. Oh, yeah, yeah, feelings over yeah. facts, you know, uh, anger over analysis. As a scientist, I mean, how do you make sense of what's going on right now? Yeah, it's start? frustrating. Uh, all I can say is the universe is in good shape. It's Earth that has all the problems, right? <laughs> so it's a frustrating time because you try to have a rational, in informed conversation with someone about what is objectively true. And then people argue vociferously against it. Right. And it's, it's revealing itself on many levels. I mean, there's the comical level where you have this movement of people who are sure the earth is flat. Right. And so we laugh at that, and you might even sort of discount it. But that is a symptom, I think, of some other deeper um, state of mind where maybe it's not a state of mind. Perhaps it's just a state of not knowing what science is and how and why it works. Yeah. We spend time in school learning, you know, you take a science class, we all did. I think the way it's taught is here's a satchel of knowledge, mm -hmm. which is facts. Learn them and then move on. And, 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 and bubble on the test. Bubble and on the done. test and, and move done. on. Now you take the next class without realizing that science is a way of querying nature. Science is a way of asking questions about what you do not know. Mm. And if you don't think of it that way, right. you'll just leave the science class behind, you'll sell your textbook, right. and you move on, and then you, you, you might feel the freedom to discount it as you would discount anything else you might have learned. Is, is, are we running out of time on climate? Yes, the broader problem is, if you have politicians arguing about what is established objective truths, then you're wasting time. Right. You're wasting everybody's time. That's not what politics should be. I have nothing against politics. I understand we live in a complex world. People have different ideas and feelings about what kind of world they want to live in. I get that. I'm mature enough to understand that. The problem comes about is when you go behind closed doors and you're arguing about what the scientists tell you, not arguing about what to do about, about what the scientist tells you. But the the more those are delayed because you're wondering about whether the science is true, even though you have reports from scientific agencies establishing this, yeah. uh, yeah. I, I, I worry for the future of the country. But what is the thing that worries you the most about climate? We've had relatively stable climate. No ice ages, no hot spells, and we've had these ice caps that have remained, primarily in, in Antarctica and Greenland. Oh my gosh, if you melt those ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, the water levels will rise and come to the level of the Statue of Liberty's elbow. Okay? So, we are talking not so much, oh, it's so hot, it's going to kill me. No, we're talking about sea level change and where are all the greatest cities in the world? They're on the ocean's edge, on the river's edge. My point is, what's going to happen first? The coastal cities will get flooded. You're not going to just see water levels slowly rise. That will happen, but that's not what you're going to notice first. The storm 
the swell that previously only brought the water to here now breaches your city walls. You'll see it in the extremes of the weather. And, and this will destabilize the world. And you know who knows about this is the military. Yeah, the, the Pentagon has no debate. The Pentagon has no debate. You know who else doesn't have a debate? Insurance companies. Right, right. But you're saying our, our, our cities are at risk, our civilizations are at risk, you're going to displace a whole bunch of people, and that could cause all kind of wars. It'll happen faster than you can move the city inland. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and that, so that, that level of instability is something that, that worries me. Something else that you talk about is this whole idea of the, the relationship between the military and science. And, uh, you know, when Trump came out with his whole idea of the Space Force, uh, because I'm a progressive, I was like, well, that's just nuts, it's a crazy idea. But then I looked into it. I want you to see what I found out about the Space Force, and I want to get your reaction to it. Sure. Space Force. President Trump says his proposed Space Force would prepare us for any potential Star Wars. Great shot, kid. That was one in a million. A new equal branch of the military. Now, the last time the U.S. created a new military branch was 1947. That was the Air Force. It would manage space missile systems, build and launch satellites, and oversee all the military space-related programs that are currently being run by other departments like NASA or the Air Force. The new force would even have its own intelligence arm designing and operating spy satellites. The U.S. military has been a space player for quite some time, with the space shuttle actually delivering classified payloads like spy satellites into orbit. And this, the X-37B. It's a 29-foot unmanned space plane. It launches and lands like the old space shuttle. It stayed in orbit now for over two years at a time, but its mission is classified. President Trump says the force is necessary because adversarial countries like Russia and China are already building weapons and anti-satellite systems that could threaten the United States. When it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. But not everybody is over the moon about this new agency. Some are worried that this new branch would be just too expensive. Some people are putting the cost at $12.9 billion over the first five years alone. It's a trap! Other critics are worried that you could spark a space race that could lead to real combat in the cosmos. So the Trump administration is hoping to get the new agency a liftoff by 2020, but in order for this to be anything other than pie in the sky, Congress must approve it. But is this a good idea or a bad idea, according to you? It may be some ideas are neither good or bad. They're just the right thing to do. Just because the idea came out of the Trump administration doesn't make it an, ir an irrational suggestion. Hey, hey, listen, though, well, that, that's actually good to hear. Yeah, as you correctly noted, you would, you would shift away from the Air Force what is already controlling the U.S. Space Command, and it would just become its own branch. And if I would, if, if I would throw in maybe uh, uh, asteroid defense, why not? You wrote a book. Uh, about this relationship between astrophysics and war um, and, and the way that almost inevitably science and, and the military accelerate each other. Um, why, why did you write that book and what do you hope that people get from this book? The relationship between science and military might is well known, all right? It, it wasn't soldiers who invented the catapult. There was some engineer in the back room who said, hey, I can do this. And then military leaders said, let's take it. And use it. All right? And so... So for physics, you know, they made the bomb, and the chemists made the napalm, and the biologists might weaponize anthrax. What does the astrophysicist do? I care about things like dim things that I'll use multispectral imaging to detect. I care about sending moving spacecraft to intersect moving objects in space. I care about navigation. Where I am on the sky and where I am on Earth. And all of that can be used by the military. All of that. Yeah. Not only can be used, has been used. Are you trying to warn us that, that, about that? Or are you just trying to make sure that we understand it? Help me understand your passion about that. Thank you. I grew up in New York City. It's a progressive city. It's a progressive place. My first awareness of culture and news was late 60s. And what is the state of the Vietnam War on our conscience? War e the equation was war equals bad. Right. And I had no way to understand why there were statues of heroic soldiers in reference to other wars. And I would have to mature into the state of mind, realizing that there are times when a bad agent rises up 
and you would be irresponsible as a contributing member of civilization if you did not stop it. And that's what happened in the Second World War with Adolf Hitler. Right. People rose up and you weren't saying, oh, war is bad, don't use my new invention to help defeat Hitler. You were saying, here, do it, use it as much as you can and I'll work on some more. Mm -hmm. So once I realized this and I said, I know my people, my, my historic brethren have been handmaidens to this, especially when it came to navigating the world. We don't make the bombs, but we tell you how to get to where you're going and how to find your enemy again and how to know a coastline if you're going to take over that land. But in this book, I don't, I'm not there to judge it. I'm there to expose it. Well, listen, I, I am excited about the book. I know a lot, of, a lot of people are. We got so much more to talk about when we get back. Coming up, we got more with Neil deGrasse Tyson, including answers to some of the most pressing science questions in the news right now when we get back. I'm here with the most famous astrophysicist in the universe, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Time for a lightning round. Okay, here's my stuff. First of all, is Pluto a planet? Yes no, or no? No, next. Uh, Get over it. Next. I, it, it's so wrong. <laughs> it's so wrong. It ain't no okay. business being a, it, it. Number two, there is a skull shaped asteroid that's coming toward the Earth during ha Halloween. Should I be scared? No. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll come near us. We'll get some good shots of it. And I promise you, it will not look exactly like a human skull, in spite of the artist's renderings. Okay. It'll be far enough away, you don't have to worry about it. No, nothing to worry about. No, I promise you. Okay. What's the one thing that you know nothing about? Oh. Stumped him! Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I don't... I wish I knew how to compose music. In another life, that's what I'll do. I, I, want, I want to compose music for Broadway musicals. That's a, that's a fantasy of mine. Oh, that'd be nice. In that'd a different nice. life, yeah. Different okay. life. We, we still, you still got time. Um, I said a different life, not this one. No. <laughs> I'm busy. I got more to do in this life, okay? In, in, in the multiverse. Uh, la last question. Carl Sagan's gone. Uh, Stephen Hawking's gone. Yeah. Uh, did you ever think, when you were a little black kid watching Carl Sagan, that at some point the most beloved scientist in America, maybe in the world, would be an African American man. No, and I still, I'm still a little bit freaked out. I think I don't view it as a personal achievement. I view it as evidence that people have a little bit. Of, everybody's got a little bit of geek in them, mm -hmm. and I'm there tickling it for them, and I'm stimulating <laughs> it, and it rises up, yeah. and they want more. And so my hope for the future is that this bit of stimulation gets people to want to care about what is objectively true, care about science, care about technology, care about the future of our country and the future of civilization itself. And if I'm a catalyst for that, that's great. I don't even have to be remembered for any of it. You know what I want on my tombstone? A uh, quote from Horace Mann, be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. Yeah, beautiful. Listen, Neil deGrasse Tyson, give his brother a round of applause. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Everybody. Everybody check out the book that's called Accessory to War. I'm Dan Jones of Dan Jones Show. Thank you for watching. Peace and love for one another. I'm feeling so lonely, but this thing I'm about to talk, oh, yeah, yeah, all my people, they for bush, oh, and our children are they go for school, oh, but nobody be to talk, oh, we get to plenty, so many things where we really want to complain to you, see these people where they kill us, are the people where they get for protect me, yeah, our children, they for prison, our leaders they for prison. Now they calling for dialogue. Now who and who go talk? Oh.